Welcome to Oakham Bros. This is Eric. And I'm Michael. And if you want to learn about the secrets of the universe, the law of attraction, mysticism, brohood, gambling, movies, pop culture, archangels, magic, good food, business, health, family, and mediumship, smash that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, press the noti icon, and spread this video around like cream cheese on a New York bagel. I love it. Today we have on Suzanne Northrup. Uh, she is an author, podcaster, TV show host, and a psychic medium. She has written four books and hosted uh, the television show The Afterlife with Suzanne Northrup. She participated in the Afterlife Experiments, which was featured on HBO. You can visit SuzanneNorthrup.com for more wow. information. I'm impressed. My first book. Well, th thank you for coming on. We're really excited to chat with you. Great. Great and to have you. Thanks. Uh, so about 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, you were on the HBO documentary life after life with Dr. Yes. Gary Schwartz. We mm -hmm. would love to start there. Okay. Um, how did you get involved with that? And, uh, what was the experience like, um, being in Arizona, like with all these mediums? Well, actually there really wasn't any mediums in, in Arizona at the time. <laughs> really? Well, yeah. Well, we all came from other places. Actually, three of us came from New York. <laughs> so, there you yeah. go. Um, so I was, a, well, you, you know, it was, it was Lucky Duck Productions, which is Ella, Ella, Linda Ellaby's company. Okay. And uh, to be honest with you, if we fast forward, she was actually kind of doing this to disavow mediums. She was really like out to, yeah, I know there's a look on your face, Michael. I mean, yes, Michael. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yes. She, she was out to really disprove that it, it doesn't exist and to, to expose us as frauds. I mean, that was really her intent course i didn't learn this until after the whole thing was and ended. boy did you show her <laughs> yeah yes well anyway um I, i'm not so sure she still kind of believes but you know i mean it was it's she's a journalist and she does right. journalist type things and of course the, the, the thing is it was it was i'm trying to remember if it was before or after the sixth sense because i had done all so many shows at that time um but i i do know that you know there was a lot of we got a lot of airplay in msnbc all kinds of um, unbelievable media stuff and of course they had a big a big to do because it was HBO. Right. Anyway, so I got contacted um, by Lisa, the uh, who was the director of the of the piece, and she had heard about me. Uh, I, she lived in she lived in New York, I think, at the time. And obviously, anybody who does anything in media in New York, I don't have to tell you, goes like wildfire. So I had been doing media for for, for quite a few years in New York. I was actually one of the first people to do any media in New York. Um, and so I got a call from her and she said, we're doing this documentary. Um, we, we, we've heard about this scientist out in Tucson, Arizona, who's doing a lot of studies on what we call survival of consciousness. And um, so he's actually, what he's actually looking for a group of people, a group of mediums that he can use for his scientific studies. Now, I don't know if you guys know about science stuff, but science all has to do with data. And you can't, you can't disprove or, or prove anything either way without data. So you have to have data to do it, which is why you got to have really more than one person, which is sort of the premise of the whole kind of idea. So I got a phone call from her and uh, I said, you know, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the invite, but I'm not really interested. I don't need to have, you know, wires put to my head and do all that. I, I did right. that when, when I was a medium at a time that nobody was a medium. So I said, you know, but again, thank you very much. So she went away. And, uh, and, and, and actually what happened is that then she had John Edward call me, which is interesting. Uh, I have known John since he was, a, was, was 16 years old. Um, and in those days, the only way that you could do any kind of events were at, at hotels or psychic fairs, which is what right. they were. Um, and so this was a psychic fair and I was the keynote speaker and he walked in and was kind of very enamored by me and, you know, the rest of it is sort of history. But anyway, um, I was sort of the first medium that he met at that time. So he called me up and he said, are you interested in doing this, 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 um, this, 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 you know, this HBO thing? Um, and I go, really, John, I'm not kind of really interested. He goes, really sure. And I go, look, no, I don't think I need to do this right now. Anyway, so a few days later, then I get a phone call from Dr. Gary Schwartz. And he says, listen, you know, you've done this more than anybody in this group, except for George Anderson. Um, and he said, you know, I really would like for you to be part of this. I'm really putting myself on the line and, and I, and I would like to, your, 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 your input. So, you know, we ended, he's Long Island boy, um, Gemini, same sign. So I said, okay, you're putting your, your, yourself on the line. I guess I should go ahead and do it. So it was because of him that I decided to do it. 
So I there was know. him, him, me, um, George Anderson, John Edward, me, um, another woman who's not no longer here, and another one that was in California. California woman was like the only person that Gary at that time knew because he didn't know anybody else. I mean, he was a he was, was an esteemed professor, and here he was really putting his toe in the water to right. you know go forward with this. And the really the only reason he was really doing it was his, his was his was his wife at the time, who was also a major scientist, and her father was a scientist. And one day she just said to Gary, she said like you know well, you know, what do you think my father is? And he like looks at her like, well, your father's dead. And yeah, she says, but you're a scientist. You're supposed to figure out where and why this happened. Right. So he really put his tenure on the line and um, did this behind closed doors. HBO found out about it. And so they approached him. So we all went out there to the whole deal. And uh, he had never done anything like this. He had sent me something like, I don't know if you've ever dealt with science people before, but they, they, don't just, they don't just send a couple of pages of an outline. They send you like 15 or 16 pages. Mm -hmm. And he was sending me 15 to 16 pages of how he was going to do this experiment. And, you know, finally, I just like I said, Gary, I said, listen, no disrespect. First of all, no medium is going to work the way you're talking about this because we don't work that way. Everybody works differently. Every medium's got has got their own style. They they pick up information the whole way. Yada yada yada. You've got to let them do their thing, and then then you record it, and then you figure out from that. Right. Um, and John actually, who has a background in, in in medicine stuff, and he says, yeah, we should also do the you know the EKGs to the brain because let's see how the brain is going to work with that as well. Right. Uh, which this is another story I'll sort of say. But anyway, so we we all decided to do it. We went out there. Um, it was pretty pretty interesting. I was chosen to be the first one to go out there. Let Suzanne go first. So Suzanne went first with the the the, the thing on the head with the, the the nodes or whatever they want to call those right. EKG things. And uh, and we sort of did the thing and just like you were supposed to just basically do your thing. So all five of us did our thing. And then what he does is he puts all of that information in the data. And in the and it's it's like a graph, so it's yep. like how many hits or how many you know that that each person has, and that's how you figure the percentage of it. So he was going on the premise of Michael Jordan because Arizona is a big big right. basketball state, which I never knew at the time. He put the graphs in the book. He put the graphs in the book, right? Yeah. And so that's when I that's when I was told I I scored the highest, but I, I never said anything. But he said it's it's in the book now. But anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank no, you. No, no sweat off your back, right? That, that was that, yeah. At that point, you know. Um, so it, it, it's a, a basketball town, and so which I didn't know. I don't know if you guys know that. So yeah. they were using the premise of Michael Jordan. Okay, so who's considered to be one of the best basketball player in the world? Michael Jordan. What's his percentage of stats per game? Can you tell me? Of I hits. No, no clue. Okay, actually, it's only forty percent. Oh, okay. Because we're talking about a team. Right. Right. So uh, and for the team, he only scored about 40%. Okay. Okay. I was scoring in the 90% time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what the book said. Yes. And how I, can I, that I, journalist, how could that journalist still be a skeptic? Eric, when you have done what I've done, as long as you've done what I've done, <laughs> you let, you learn to let this stuff roll off you. It's like, you know, we could get into other political things. Like, how do you not, how do you not know this? I mean, I don't really know, you know? Right. So, um, again, I just, you know, my whole thing is I do what I do. Right. So after we did that, you know, and what was kind of interesting is that, is that when HBO filmed this, HBO didn't trust Gary. Gary didn't trust HBO. He right. didn't trust any media stuff, which I, to be honest with you, I'm really glad he did because what happened is that after the, we, they got the five persons, they had to find quote unquote, somebody that would be willing to be filmed. And you got to use the same person. Cause again, we're talking about stats. So there's a book called Hello from Heaven. I'm sure you guys know about it. Judy Guggenheim wrote the book. And, yes. um, and so they said, she knows a lot of people that have, that have had ADCs. So she just found that there was a woman in Arizona that had a lot of intense deaths in her life. She lost her son. She lost this person, that person. She agreed to do this. And so when she agreed to do it, what happened is that that's why we have each person you know, do it. We were only allowed yes and no questions that we were not allowed anything other than that. And like I said, it, it was all recorded. Um, when we, like I said, after we got done with the first day, um, it was, it was, it was pretty good. I think, you know, John and I, you know, we're very pretty connected. 
Uh, George kind of like did George World, but but um, we, you know, we 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 were actually pretty pleased that we, that we really did it because it, you know, you you go in there cold and you know nothing and you're not even allowed to look at the person, which to me doesn't I, that that does make you know I have no issue with that because I'm a, a real audio medium, so I you know I'd rather not even look at them to be. Honest what does that mean, being an audio medium? Okay, so there are mediums that 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 are very. Some are more clairvoyant. Some are more clairaudient. You know, I'm I'm a clairaudient sensor, but I'm also a traditional trance medium, which means that you know it, it doesn't matter kind of like where anybody is. People think that you have to have you know a person in front of you to talk to dead people, and I, my joke is like they're dead anywhere. It doesn't matter where they are. Right. So you know, it's irrelevant whether you're whether you're you know in the room with them or not. Right. Um, so anyway, it was it was a pretty huge. So anyway, so HBO didn't trust Gary. Gary didn't trust them. And so what proceeded to happen was because Gary owned all the footage, HBO didn't own the footage. He right. owned it and wasn't going to give it to them unless they they wrote the you know on the piece of paper that you're only going to show what I want you to show and you're not going to go in there and rip it apart and make it look better than it is or worse than it is. Right. And he still owns that footage, by the way. Um, which is really kind of interesting. And so then with them not trusting each other and this whole kind of thing that was, go that was going on, it, it sort of like put another, you know, element in it. And that other element was exactly what, what I'm talking about, a distrust. And, and it, what, what happened in, a, in some of the interviews, because there was, I mean, I have this big interview with Linda Ellaby, um, which I actually have it on my, up on my site under my membership stuff, that it really, it, it really she did go in there. Lisa happened, Lisa Jackson, the, the, the director, happened to have been very much involved with mediumship. Her mother had, had experiences when her sister died. Um, and so she was not objective to it, although she was still a good, very good director. And, and I think specifically Linda brought her in because Linda was a skeptic and she felt like, you know, Lisa had, well, I think she's done a lot of stuff with, with Linda, to, to be honest with you. So that was sort of how that was. Um, right. But, you know, Linda Ellaby, she's a tough, tough journalist. I mean, you know, and she's been around right. for a really, really long time. But um, I, I think that, I think it did really well. You actually still can get it on YouTube, I think. Um, yes. You, you can see the video on YouTube. It's in like nine parts on YouTube. It is. Okay. Yeah, and it's interesting yeah. because what they, what they, for a long time, they only aired it on Halloween. <laughs> they can't resist. Um, and it was never really sort of put into the, to the sort into the sequence of, of how it was put into it. So, what happened after that, of course, um, once Gary had a taste of, you know, mediums in his, in his corner, then of course he wanted to do more studies. Um, no one else except for John and I were willing to do it. And really? so th then the second time and the third time around, what happened is it, it got much more difficult. So you've all heard the expression of double blind. Yes. Okay. So not only were, was I not able to see the person, but I was not able to listen to the person. So what we did is that we, we, they put us in a room and they had us facing the wall. And then you had the, the person that we were supposed to you know, give the messages from sit behind us. And then there was a moderator asking that person, Yes and no questions. So they didn't, we didn't know if it was man, woman, old, young, whomever. Because uh, right. obviously there's a lot of older people in Arizona, but there's also, you know, the university out there. And right. so then we had to feed all that information in. I remember at one point I was walking out the door across the campus. <laughs> no, it wasn't across the campus because we did it in Maryville. And, and, and they freaked out on me. They're like, you can't walk out here in the grass because you might see somebody. You're like, okay. So how did you score on the double blind? Just as, just as high. Just, just as, high. as high, the 90%. More, yeah, yeah. more than double of Michael Jordan, yeah, who's yeah. the greatest basketball right, player right. of all time. Yeah, yeah. But what was also interesting about that is that in the testing, what, what, we, we, what they also learned was this, is that in the first testing, when they had, uh, they had us do a couple of additional people, George and, and me actually, but not John. And there was a woman. And at the end of it, she, she said George did really, really well. She thought I did okay. And so Gary said, okay, so what, what, what were some of the points that you felt like he did really well on um, that she didn't hit? So all the things that she read back to Gary were actually ones that I hit. Really? So 
you see there besides the psychological element in her head she wanted it to be george i don't know why maybe right. she had wanted a guy and not a girl i don't know but when he went back and played it to her she says oh wow suzanne said that and he goes yeah suzanne said that not george so there's 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 so many different <laughs> different layers now you ask about the visual eric Okay, so John is kind of, a, although he's an audio medium as well, he's a real visual worker. So a lot of times he'll get messages and visions. So there was, you know, one of the people that came in, he kept seeing the movie Pretty, Pretty in Pink. And actually the guy had a pink shirt on. <laughs> so, so, it, it, so it, it's, you know, it, it, I think unless, unless you actually, in reality, really do this work and how you receive information, and you never really know. And, and, and I've done this obviously for forty years. You never know how or when or way it's going to sort of be. And, and and you do have your way of doing it. It's always so interesting. People do really hear only what they want to hear, and that is that is the truth. Right. Uh, and, and if that, people that is, don't hear what they want to hear, then they just negate everything that you they, that you do yeah. say. Right. right. Yes. Which is why, to be honest with you, I've always preferred dealing with dead people. As opposed to psychic sessions, and and by the way, just for an FYI, uh, the word psychic medium was actually coined by John. That word did not exist in the vote. The, the really, yes. John Edward did that. John Edward yeah. created that word. He, he started that word. Yes. For the record, yeah. we would love to interview him, putting that out into the universe. All right. Well, I'll, 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 if you can I, make an intro, that'd be amazing. I had a reading with John earlier this year. He was amazing. I had a reading with you recently. You were amazing. Take us to the beginning. Were you, you said, were, yeah. yeah, you were, were you born with this? Did you, yes, you yes. were born with this. So yes. you were in elementary school and you were telling the teacher, well, take us to the beginning of how this started for you. This is fascinating. Well, I don't think I remember a point in my life that it was not there, but I think when you're younger, depending on your experience determines how you do, or you don't deal with it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I use this as a joke. I don't know if this was, is what really what happened with not, but I did get hit by a car when I was five years old. Okay. Um, I broke no bones or nothing, but I got thrown down the street about 20 feet. My shoes and socks went one way. I went the other way. Oh um, I do know that George Anderson was very, very sick. I think he had encephalitis. Rheum he had something with the brain. Yeah, with yeah. the brain. Yes. And so he had that at a very young age. Um, I not sure if that's necessarily true about John because John, believe it or not, was very skeptical. Um, his mom was very into mediums and would have them at the house all the time and everything else. Um, you know, Italian boy from Long Island, but but uh, you know, so he was a little more sort of in the, the sort of the, the skeptical, you know, analytical sort of type thing. I just, I just, I just was an only child for like nine years. Um, I was raised in, in a very a rural town. I spent a lot of time, you know, walking the woods and. All that kind of sort of where did stuff. you grow up where did you grow up i grew up in a place called horses new york which is near elmira oh so you're not you're not from long island i know you're on no. long island now okay no. no i'm not on long island no. i've oh, never been on no i've never been on long island oh i thought no. you were far okay. i know everybody thinks i'm on long people I think, think i live island. i live in california colorado <laughs> you live no. everywhere the there is something yeah. in the water in new york though i have to say there, george anderson yes, you yes, yes, john edward yes. Teresa, like yeah Thomas John, I know, is from Boston or something, but he's in New York, yes. Chicago. Right. Chicago. Yeah. But like this. Well, actually, is he's from Massachusetts. Yeah, he is from Massachusetts. And he yes. was living. Yeah. But yeah. What, so what do you I think? I sort of, sort of, just sort of discovered him too and discovered Don. But, uh, so, and it's interesting that you say that because I was raised in Horses, New York, which you probably do not or do not know this. It's very near uh, Rochester, Syracuse. Do you remember the story of the Fox Sisters? Yes. Okay. I just read about them. Okay, yes. so the Fox Sisters, that was it. But you also... Do, do oh, you explain know, the Fox Sisters, because I don't know. Okay, the Fox Sisters, there were two sisters, and they were in, I don't know, the house that they lived in, whatever it is, but th there was this ghost there, or they called this ghost. And the ghost would do the knocking or the rapping on the, on the, on the, on the ceiling, whatever it was. And so they had this communication with, with, the, with, the, with the, uh, the ghost. Now... Truth be told, we don't know what was true or what was not true in the, in the situation. But right. I do know that they became very famous and people came from a lot of other places away. Yes. But I will give you the one that was also more famous. You know who Jane Roberts were was is Jane no. Roberts? No. You ever heard of the Seth material? Yes. Oh my God, I read this. That was okay. her. Seth material. Jane Roberts lived in my hometown in Elmira. Oh my God. 
So, uh, so you're, set, you're, you're talking to the encyclopedia here of seriously of, of, this, so like, of this world. Yes. Set, somebody was channeling this 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 spirit named Seth, and he Seth, would tell right. her things. Correct. I, I read the book; it freaked me out. Yes. Like, now it's interesting because she was okay. So we were we were discussing this trance mediumship and channeling. So, so okay. In the do you remember when Shirley MacLaine came out with her book? Yes. It was, it was a big post, deal. Postcard from the edge, right? No, out of the limb. Out on a limb? Okay. Okay. And her big thing was that she really put herself out of the limb and really, you know, really believed in the past life stuff and whatever it is. So it put her in the Hollywood scene. In the Hollywood scene, what happened at that time, there was this big fad called channeling. Channeling had to do with dealing with entities like Seth of coming through the person. Mm -hmm. Very often when that happens, you do go into a form of trance. You don't always remember. But and, 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 and I like to tell people, they don't take you over. It's an interchange of energy. So that's right. what happened with Jane Roberts. So she was kind of one of the first persons that really did channeling or trance channeling with, with Seth and did all the Seth books. Um, and interesting enough, drank beer while she was doing her sessions, which I always thought was really interesting. So down the road, um, like I said, she uh, surely had this, you know, this, this vision. And so what happened is in, in Hollywood, it became this whole thing about channeling her first connection with this guy, Kevin Ryerson. Um, and he became a big thing. Then there was Ramtha who was very big. And uh, so they were all channelers. Now, the reason why I, I always bring this story up is because the obvious thing is again, it's a form of channeling, but you're channeling the entity. You take over the personality, you, you know, take over the mannerisms and all that other kind of stuff. I sort of do that when I do trance work with my, my, my control. That's what it's called a control. Her name is Elizabeth. She's Scottish. I don't know anything else about her except for I have the ability to go into trance. And when I do, she sort of like comes so, up. Hold on one second. That that trance, you know, we've interviewed a lot of mediums on our show, and trance yes. work is not something that we've Has touched ever on. Been, yeah, it's never. Um, been I because, would love to hear more. I know that was all that happened on the um the Netflix the Netflix documentary that was most yeah. recent. Um, yeah, but I'm, expand I'm not on sure, that. I'm not sure about that one, but I do know that I came from old school, and that was an old school thing. Um, if you follow a lot of the traditional mediumship, if you go back as far as I'm, I'm sure you know the thing about Arthur Colin Dole, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know that he be, he was the one that actually created Sherlock he, Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, exactly. But he also created this this huge building in Parliament in London. Yes. Where it's still a building where they have healers and and and, and all this kind of stuff. I've always thought that they based some of the some of the stuff on the on the book here or the movie Hereafter. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. And with, I think it was Matt George. Matt Damon. George. Matt Damon yes. was George. Arthur Conan Doyle was part of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. That's a whole other. I don't. That's know if, a whole other story. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, I've been reading so, about that. So anyway, so Arthur Conan Doyle. There was a man by the name of Arthur Ford. Again, you don't know these people's names. I know that he was also a pioneer. It's interesting. I'm trying to remember the the, the, the time sequence, but it was either 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 Arthur was right before Edgar Casey, or they were somewhere within that that period of either right. 20 or 30 years. And Edgar Casey, by the way, was a trance medium. OK, right. but what he did is he went into trance and gave information and a person had to, you know, ask the questions again, using the person, ask the questions, view the bodies, view the past lives, whatever it is. And then he would give the information after viewing the bodies. Okay. Right. So anyway, during the 70 periods, because I want to lose this period of channeling becoming a big deal. And by the way, there is a book called Channeling. I am in that book. Um, and so people would come up to me and they say, like, do you channel? And, you know, it started POing me off because it's like, no, I talk to dead people. Believe it or not, mediums were not big in that time. Uh, right. Everything was about channeling because once, once something hits Hollywood, that becomes the end thing. And so I says, no, I talk to dead people. So I created Dead People Society. Literally, I own <laughs> I own that. Instead so, of Dead Poet Society, you got Dead People Society. Dead People Society. Society. And, and I write about it, by the way, in my book, my first book that came out in 94, I write about the Dead People Society, but now I now own the, you know, the, the whatever you want to call it. But the domain. Right. The domain. So, have you, you written a book, you know, because like you said, you're encyclopedia. Do you have like, you should, if you haven't already, you need a book that's called The History of Modern Day Mediumship. I know, and I should probably be the one to do it, but I, you know, and it's, it's, you know, I was trying to do a memoir book and so then I got like into the emotion of that and, and I had to put that down for a while. 
But mm -hmm. there, there, I mean, the thing is that there are those books, Eric. It's just there's nothing of now. And so what's happened is that, is that unfortunately or fortunately, uh, when things become in, they become very, I have nothing along with the commercial stuff. But what I have a few issues with the commercial stuff is it's thrown ethics out the door. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Now, I will tell you um, that Teresa, I've met her. I have even worked with her, maybe even against my will. But she does, to me, what you do is the biggest no-no in the world. Which is? You do, you do not walk up to people and do messages. It's against the rules. It's against the laws. It's against the spiritual laws. Number one, you could really hurt somebody. And mm -hmm. so what happens, it becomes, I believe, a television game. Sorry. That's my thing. Okay. John wouldn't do that. Right. John would do, you are coming into a studio and you are saying that I am agreeing to do this, period. Right. right. Okay. So when it becomes commercialized, that's what's happened. You're going to sit in a nail parlor. And you know, I mean, we're not idiots here. Don't tell me you don't see cameras around the room. Right. <laughs> and, and, right. And, and in a deli in New York City. I mean, like, why are there cameras all around? Oh, she just happened to go ahead. You know, whatever they have in delis. Anyway, don't get me going on that one. But the, the point is, is that is that I come from old school, which is number reason why I have these these huge ethics. <laughs> which is why there were television shows that I refused to do. Um, as a matter of fact, I probably have the only television show that was completely done without any edits of 10 seasons. Really? <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, yeah, 10 episodes. <clears throat> what it was, I, what it was I, done in Canada and they didn't have any money. So. <laughs> Suzanne, what I find amazing, and this is what's so cool, like this is what I find so cool about it is that like people think mediumship is people that talk to the dead. There's, it, it's kind of like autism. Like there's a spectrum right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, you're not, mm -hmm. someone isn't just, you know, autistic and they're on like a level 10. Like there's different levels to everything. Absolutely. There's different levels to this mediumship thing. Absolutely. And I just want to jump back to the channeling real quick. Cause I'm fascinated by this stuff. I've seen channelers. I've never been with a channel, but I've seen it kind of like as a third party, like watching on YouTube. Right. You think these people are full of shit. You yes. think that they're absolutely nuts going, Oh, when they come with the accent yeah, or like right, whatever it is, right, like, is that, right. is that the truth? Is that what, so like when you meet with your Scottish spirit, mm -hmm. what, what happens? Which I don't, I don't do a lot of trance work anymore, to be honest with you. Why? Why though? Well, okay. Partly because the way that the work has shifted, people have gotten used to, you know, the, the Johns and the, whatever it is. I don't have to go to that level to get information. Interesting. It's just that okay. it's just, it's just a particular, it was just like, that was how I started out in my in my profession. Mm -hmm. That's what I became known at. Um, I I did you know tradition traditional seances. My first book was called Seance: A Guide for the Living, but everybody has a bad connotation with seance. Yes, so, they do. So as a result of we had to change the name when it came out in paperback. Real? So, what was what did you change the name to? Well, we changed it for it, first of all, it was called Science: A Guide for the Living. Then it was I mean seance. Then it was seance, the healing messages from beyond. And that was still a negativity because they right. put it into mass market. And so then what happened when my when my second book got picked up, what, we did, what I did is I used, we called it second chance. And I took all of the material from my first two books. And then I added on to it all the stuff that I've done on the HBO special. Okay. So it, it, you know, it added like a 30 additional parts and second chance was okay. So again, and people don't, people, people, are always smart. They don't know what the word seance means. Seance means sitting. So what do you think you're doing? It's French for sitting. So what do you think you're doing in a situation? You're doing a sitting. So but again, it's got that connotation. And again, that comes back to the Hollywood stuff that we were talking about. Right. And, you know, and all the, you know, it's like they have a field day, particularly around holiday. So no one people are spooked out about it. Then people get very spooked out about the idea of dead people. And they don't understand that dead people is basically in relationship to love. I mean, that's all we're talking about. We're talking right, about right. Th these people. We don't stop loving them because they become dead people, and they don't stop becoming like stop becoming love. But there's a, with, you know, like I said, because of Hollywood and all these other things that I like the, the Exorcist. I never even seen that movie, but um, they muddy it. It muddies they muddy the name, it. Right. right? Yeah. Well, that's so what so my, my point is yeah. my point is going back to my point is that that's why I get upset with a stuff like a Teresa. I see. Because what it does is it, it makes it a parlor game. When you're talking about people's hearts, we're talking about people who lose children. We're talking about people who lose more than one children. You know, I mean, so I take that very serious, right. which is, you know, why, you know, 
I turned I wa- down a lot of television shows. I once said, I once asked George Anderson. I was I was getting a reading with him. I, Eric, you were with me, and I said, George, do you watch Ghost Adventures, which is like this really cool show on the Travel Channel where these these guys go into a haunted house or a prison right. or whatever, and they he communicate. probably said no. And he said to me, he goes, I don't watch anything paranormal for fun. He's like, it's a bunch of bullshit. So, so yeah, so we do. I mean, George and I were doing this at the same time in New York. Right. Um, and so with that, we, we do come from the old school of ethics. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, that's, you know, I, when I was, I, I, I was, I was fortunate because, you know, I had the, the, the gift very young and I didn't, this was not was the last thing I thought I'd ever do in my life, to be quite honest with you. I said, no, 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 no. And what happened is that, you know, I had lived in New York, the, 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 the long story really quick, I was living in New York City and I, I worked the same goodies and, um, and, and people would come in the store and I would say like, you know, that guy's stealing stuff and they all laughed, they all laughed at me. But then, you know, later on they found out I was telling the truth. They wanted to know how I knew it. And I said, like that person told them and they thought, they thought it was kind of a joke. Anyway, so I was living with this guy at the time. And he goes, if I don't get you out of here, they're going to lock you up. So we, he says, let's move to California where they're all crazy. <laughs> so we did. So we moved to San Francisco. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and what happened is that, you know, I, I ended up living with this, this woman who both her parents were shrinks. Uh-huh. And they, of course, wanted to put me under the night. And this is the time when, when because I know I went through it, that they, they, put, they put people through shock therapy because I went through six months of it. And uh, so I know it really well. And, um, and I said, and after living in San Francisco for this time and this stuff going on, I said, like, I, I, this is, this is crazy. I got to get out of here. So I moved to Northern California and lived in the middle of nowhere land for four years, three or four years without electricity and water and figured it out on my own. And I figured out I wasn't crazy. I just knew I was different. I just had to find out where that, cause they didn't have the words psychics. I mean, they didn't have those words in, right. in the seventies going on. So you had a rough go figuring out that, yeah, you, that you weren't way. crazy. Well, I think I I knew I wasn't crazy. I just didn't know what it was that I had, <laughs> except for right. I would know things. There's no Google yeah. for you, yeah, you know, for you no, to search. There was no Google to search. So I moved to LA. Um, my my background is music. That's what I have a degree in, and so I moved to LA and um, and I, I I went to the, uh, the 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 big club, which is still still there. Oh God, the one on Sunset Boulevard. The Roxy. No, it's the it's um whiskey. It's, when they they do Monday night Monday night Troubadour 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 okay Troubadour and so I did that and I got a standing ovation I said like wow that I have something cool so maybe it's time for me to leave the woods and move to 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 L A of which I did uh-huh. uh, and uh, I got very much involved in, with this uh, again you, there there were no places except for for except for either Masonic halls or sp- spiritual churches or in in those days and so there was a woman by the name of Trudy Jarnell who was an amazing woman. Um, who came from Europe? Was actually as a was as a young girl was in the Holocaust. Her her and she escaped, I guess, with one of her members of her family. Um, so she was a really interesting woman. She became very well known. So she had this this church, and I went to it every Sunday, uh, and and I got to see mediums and you know everything else. And and so there was this one person that wanted me to study with him, and I go like, no, I don't want to do this stuff. And then I met this other woman. Her name was was. Um, Betty Sitter, who's also dead, but she was the one of the first psychics um, to work with the police. And she was actually responsible for helping solve the Hillside Strangler murders wow. in amazing. San Francisco. And so she was a pretty amazing woman. So she took me under her wing. And what she did is I was her star. <laughs> and so she constantly used me. And so I was constantly from day one standing in front of people and giving messages, except for my specialty was, was connecting with dead people. So there was this one day that I stood up and gave this message and she looked at me and she goes like, you better hit your source again. And like, she was this tough Scorpio. And I go like, okay, I better hit my source again. She goes, do not you ever, you ever give a message that you do not hit your source and you don't know what you're doing. Well, so I came from that school, like with the, you know, with like the, the getting Catholic school. The, really? the risk. So that's the school I came from. And you are honored to do this. This is your chosen to do this. You will do this work. No, no, no. I just want to do music. Oh yes, you will because you've been right. chosen. So right. the rest is so so the city of angels, which is really the city of angels. There was a lot going on at that time. Um, there was a place called Manny Hall, and the, some of the top people. You know, I'm sure some of these people you don't know, but the woman Catherine Ponder, whom I believe when when they did the book Resurrection, when they did the book that Ellen Burstyn did with uh, Sam 
Sam, what's his face? Um, it's, it's called Resurrection. And it's okay. about, she was a healer. And there was a woman by the name of Catherine Kuhlman who lived in Pennsylvania. And she was a healer. And they would line up at her church to go see her. Right. So there was this unbelievable, see, you know, there's always things through cycles and periods. But during that time, there were these, these people did amazing things. You know, some were Brits and some came here and some didn't. And that's why I was telling you about Arthur Ford. Who was a trans medium and his his control was Fletcher. He went to he, when he went to, to war, um, his best friend died in war, so he became his control. But he couldn't make a living at it in this in the states. He moved to England, got under the wing of uh, you know <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, and became very well known in England. Moved back to the states, and um, was the only medium to speak in, in Carnegie Hall. Wow. And had a very, very interesting life, an intense life. So he was coming back. He was from Florida. He was coming back from Florida. I think it was with his sister. I'm not sure. Got in a very bad, bad car accident. Was hospitalized. The doctor found out who he did and what he did. So the doctor put him in morphine because he was in pain. And while he was in the morphine, Arthur, of course, had the ability to go into trance. And when he went into trance, he started asking stock questions. <laughs> That's correct. Arthur Ford got addicted to heroin. Oh, my God. And then he ended up becoming an alcoholic and lived on the streets of New York City. Holy until cow. somebody until somebody came to save him. That's Want crazy. to do this for a living? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yes. Wait, so Seriously. I have a question about angels after you, Eric, because I, I want to talk is, about angels. Is the, so, you know, you, you're, are you a psychic as well, or do you just do mediumship? Well, uh, my specialty is mediumship. And the reason why, I, 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 I'm, one thing you said, er, Eric, earlier about people hear what they want to hear, is that when I, was, when I did a combination of psychic and medium, which is really at the beginning of my, of my profession, it was like the people would come to me, you know, mostly women, but men too, and they want to know about this person. I would tell them my honestly about what I'm getting about this person. So they would ask me the same question four times until they were going to hear what they were going to hear. And I wasn't going to be the one that was going to tell them. Right. So I didn't, I didn't care about people's love lives to be honest with you. I didn't want to go down though. What I happened to be actually very good about was professions. I really, I really nailed some really benign things of professions. As a matter of fact, when the, the market crashed in 87, 88, I got like this anonymous check for like a thousand dollars from some, one of my clients. He said I saved his business or something, but anyway, really? but, but that, I, that part I had never had issue with. So um, is the, is the future written or do you do spirit tell you the future or do they just tell you something like, do they tell you what you already know? Okay. In the first place, no one's supposed to most, most supposed to tell you, what the deal is you're not there's another one you're not allowed to you're allowed to give guidance right you're not it's like you're not allowed to give you know medical information you know i'm not you know you right. can be sued for stuff like that which you're allowed to give guidance mm -hmm. and guidance doesn't have to be absolute because what you're doing is when you're doing you're taking away free will it's like it's like this person you say like oh if they go for this job or whatever it is and, and you know they're really good at it you know they're going to become top notch in it they're going to make a lot of money and whatever it is and then that doesn't happen then what happens because maybe they didn't maybe by going that way they didn't go the way that their heart told them to go or and in, into another direction and uh and so you're predicting the absolute so it, it takes away the free will basically what i'm trying to say which is we know that's what god gives us is the free will it's like you're you're dealt a deck of cards it's like what you do with the deck of cards right you know, you know you're going to have some good hands you're going to have some bad hands you're going to have you know it's like it's like yeah, good people bad people well, i mean that's you know however you that's life it, right, that's right. life exactly right so you can't really go into that route of like saying it's sort of an absolute and you take that away what i will often do I, i've learned is that if I have a sense that there is going to be something happen in somebody's family, I won't say you better go home because daddy's going to like make a, you know, a spin, so to speak. Right. I'll say like, you know, I'm just picking up some stuff about your family and maybe I, you know, some holidays or birthdays are coming up. You might want to check it out. I've given them the option. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you... and, and ethics people, that's how they're going to operate. And that's why I said there's a new world that crosses that line. And that's honestly, that's my issue. Is that right. is it dangerous to cross that line? I think so. I think right. you pay a price. 
I, my, my thing is you're going to have a rug pulling party. And you're never going to know what's going to land on your ass. Right. That's because fascinating. If you came from old school, it's like, it's like there's rules. There are rules for lawyers. There's rules for doctors. There's rules for teachers. There's rules for, you know, most, most professions. There's no rules for mine because there's no, you know, there's no quota. So there's no speak. school. There's to, no school. Yeah. There actually is a school. <laughs> believe it or not. Can, you know, it, can you get your license? So you to can't speak. get a license, you know, but you, but you can go to school, you know, um, you know, Arthur Finley in, in law in England, he, right. that, that school teaches me. Right. You know, Suzanne, have you ever worked with angels or archangels before? Are you familiar with them? Not my area. Okay. Um, I, I can tell you that we all have them. Yeah. They all work like guidance tool. Uh, what I can tell you is if you're going into the avatar realm, an avatar has never gone through the process of reincarnation. They hmm. just show up at, at, at moments when you need them in your life for sort of, sort of strange things. Literally, they've shown up on the side of the road when you needed it, you know, your car thing. They do stuff like that. Um, I, I can't tell you a lot about the angel process, okay. whether that whether they have or they haven't gone through the process of reincarnation. Again, it's 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 what it is. So do, um, you, do you believe in manifestation? Do you believe in the law of attraction? I believe in the law of traction, but I also believe uh, that's another thing that I think that's been blown out of you know process. Hundred percent. So, so you've got you've got all these people again that you know they do these things and then it doesn't happen and then they're they're upset and uh, you know you you can't say it's it's like saying every single person that does the same thing is going to get the same results. You, you 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 guys you're 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 smart. You know you know what I'm talking about. Right. It doesn't kind of work that way. Um, right. But, you know, it's, it's, but I do believe, I do believe that we have a soul program. Everybody has a soul program. What does that mean? It means that when we, when we incarnate, um, okay, so there's, 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 there's two, there's two deals here. There's the soul and then there's the personality. Okay. The personality, Eric and Michael, as cute as both you guys are, <laughs> when you. you die, when you die, you will no longer exist. However, what will exist is all of your learnings. Yep. So those learnings go into a, a bank. Okay. Your soul also has a whole lot of life experiences and the soul learnings goes into a bank. Okay. This is unbelievable. So then you come back, let's just say in another lifetime and you said like, yeah, I did that, but you know, I didn't do it as much as I wanted to, or as good as I wanted to. So if I take from this bank and I take from that bank and I choose these proper parents, because you got to choose your parents, because you got to choose the DNA, right? The gen genealogy. You can't, you know, you're not going to be an Einstein if you choose somebody that doesn't have, <laughs> parents don't have brains, right? My, right. Poor so, kid, my poor kids. Your poor kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> they got no shot. <laughs> okay, they got no shot. Well, you're saying that they may have other shots. I'm, te so, I'm teasing. Yeah, no, yeah. no, we're no Einstein. My no, but you pull from from those banks, right. and that's what decides it. Now, from my understandings, there are certain um, certain things that take several lifetimes to fine tune. One mm. is being a scientist. Wow. One is being an athlete. Um, to get to no to, way to get to like to get to yes Tom know, Brady level or something to like. You know, I'm a tennis person. So, to, you know, Roger, you know, Federer, you know, I mean, like how many Roger Federer's are there in the world? You know, fuck Eric, we're going to have to be coming back and back and back <laughs> and back and back and back so, to get to like Tom Brady's life. I got to yeah. learn how to throw a football in this lifetime. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, the, the, I mean, in, 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 again, in my brief knowledge of that, those are the two of the professions that I do know that it requires several lives. So, I mean, what about how long was like, What about writers and artists? What about writers, screenwriters, directors, filmmakers, creators? Well, if you, if you have, if you have, let's say you have a lifetime where you were very creative yeah. and you maybe read a certain level of whatever professionalism or right. whatever, and, and you come back because you've got to understand that there were periods in art, the film didn't exist. hundred percent. Right. Okay. But right. there was, there was always art. I right? got to tell you, I had a, like, I had a reading with Glenn Dove. Hang on, Eric. This is yeah. kind of coinciding with what we're talking about. I had yeah. a reading with Glenn Dove, and I'm a writer. I'm a, I'm a screenwriter. I'm an author. You know, I, I, my book is being turned into a feature uh, feature film screenplay right now. There's a lot of stuff going on in my world. Right. And Glenn Dove didn't know who the hell I was. I sat down, and he goes, you have to get this done in this lifetime. This is what your sole contract was to get this done in your lifetime mm -hmm. because you were cheated out of it in previous lifetimes. So there you go. So now you understand what I'm talking about. Yes. So, so is that, there so, – Right. So that's 
part, I mean, I call it the sole program, but a sole contract is almost kind of this, the same thing. Right. And that's why, you know, things get, that's why there's a familiar, like Mozart at five years old. I mean, there's a familiarity to, to things that this coming, like if I, if I was to honestly say to you that I worked hard to be able to do what I do, I'd really be lying Interesting. because this has been natural for oh, me my whole life. You blew my this mind. Is this is, this is great awesome interview. Because it just, you just look at, you look at like Elon Musk or you look right. at LeBron yes. James or right. you look at these people and they're just so yeah. exceptional. And yes. I'm here, you know, just like twiddling my thumbs and like you, I couldn't possibly think about the things that they're doing and it became so easy to them it's because they've had previous previous experience somewhere with along it. line they you think listen things don't fall from the sky you and i both know that you know <laughs> Unbelievable. okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna use one of my one of my examples that i used to use with my thing oh but what i was saying to you is that you know again i told you i didn't want to do this i really wanted to do music but it was like it kept coming back to me and kept coming back and I, I i was living in la i was living in california 10 years and they told me I was moving back to New York and I go like, no way. I don't want to move back to the cold. They go, you're moving back to New York. I moved back to New York. There was like one thing I could do to make a living. And that's what I'm doing. And, right. and I started doing it and I started doing it like within, within eight months, not even a year. And I, I was in the public eye. I, I was so swamped. With, I, I still have boxes in my cellar from letters from that, that period of my life. I couldn't, really? I couldn't handle it. It was, a, it was overwhelming. It's right. just overwhelming. What happens if you feel like you don't have a purpose? What happens if you just, you know, you're working? Everybody, do, honey, everybody does. Everybody does. That's some. Everybody does. So you don't have to be an Elon Musk or a Jeffrey Bezos no. to to no. be done with this fulfill, lifetime to fulfill your no. purpose. So, like, no. you know, my no. daughter is learning disabled. She was born globally apraxic, and time and time again, after I've mm -hmm. speaking with mediums and other psychics, they've said that she chose this. And by all, t you know, she's not yeah. autistic, but she uh -huh. has her challenges. Sure. And time and time again, we have you know, people don't know me from a hole in the wall. They don't have any context behind the situation, mm -hmm. and they will come and say that your daughter chose right this right and how is that how does that make you feel as a father uh frustrated sure mm -hmm. you know because it's it's challenging and you, you know mm -hmm. you want you have you, an idea it's your of, daughter right you you have an idea of what you know you think life should be like right and you know sometimes it doesn't always work that way right but you see you're coming from the perspective that i get it as a father right you're a father this you don't want this to be your your, your baby girl Right. But it's your baby girl's path. It's not right. Eric's path. Right. You know, you chose your path. You know, she chose her path. So, I mean, is that a part of, you know, your genetic? I don't know. How right. do you, how do you know yeah. you're fulfilled though? How do you know that like, you know, how do you know Elon Musk is going to come back as a homeless person in the next lifetime? You don't. Right. You don't. You know, and, and now what I will say to you is this. Um, and, and, and this is, this is not, you know, rocket science. The more power you have, the more responsibility you have, period. Mm -hmm. Period. And we know throughout history, those that have power that misused it, I don't have to go through names, but we know who we're talking about here, mm -hmm. okay? You can be. The soul can't die. Nothing can die. However, you can cease to lose the privilege of reincarnation hmm. or be recycled. Wow. How do you and is that, that is that is is that privilege? Is it is it your? Is that something that is horrible to lose? Well, I would think. It, it, is it a privilege I, to be to be reincarnated? It's a privilege to be here. Sure, it is. You have you have the privilege of being here. I, first of all, Earth, and under my understanding, is the only place we incarnate in a physical process. Yep. So, really. Sure. I mean, I'm sure there's stuff on other planets they say about that stuff, but. I don't know them, but I know in this universe, this is where we incarnate. We get a chance to go through this physical process. And yes, it is a privilege. And it's amazing to look at it like that. Well, it's unbelievable. And and we're all here for a reason in that. And it's never about the grand things. It's about the simple thing. I always talk about like, I, you know, I love the shoemaker. I got these pair of boots that I've had for like 20 years. I love them. I lecture in them. Every time the heels go up, I go buy new heels because these are the boots that I like to work in. So to me, shoemakers are like a really cool thing. Right. But if you think about it, there's something we sometimes we have things in our lives. 
it's like, you know, when they did, when they had the AIDS things, they made, you know, quilts out of the clothes. And, and, and that was, that was special to, to the, to the families of, of having, you know, the person that we love's clothes put all together. And then they, when they, I, I'm sure you saw um, in the Capitol, when they put them all together, it was beautiful. Right. It was beautiful. And, you know, it takes somebody, quilts are not easy to make. I don't mind telling you. As right. a whole process, forget, forget about the sewing. That's the putting it together, see what matches, what goes up, and you know, it's 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 an art. It's another right. form of art. So it's it, I think I think I think there's a whole lot of layers. But one of the things I think that you're asking is this: everybody has feelings in their heart. Everybody has a, loves things. Mm -hmm. We have to decide if we can turn it into something we can make money. Now, probably most things you can turn into make money. It depends on how much money you want to make, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to make a lot of money, then, you know, you've got to go into certain professions for that. And then if for somebody in the process of that, you end up getting married and you have kids, then you're locked in because you have to support your family. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and then there's some people who, uh, you know, like the guy who, that I, that I remember who created, you know, uh, the housewife things. You know, he literally mortgaged his mother's house. I don't know if you know the story. He mortgaged his mother's house. He had no money to put that that show on. And I didn't know that. Living. That it was, was Andy Cohen. I, no, it wasn't Andy no. Cohen. It was the guy who did the original uh, housewife show. Whatever those those shows are. Yeah, my wife loves those shows. I didn't okay. know. Okay. Yeah. Yes, the first, the original guy who did that. He did this in Hollywood, and he felt that there was a show for that. Uh, the something housewives. I can't remember what the first one was. He mortgaged his mother's house. <laughs> Really? It was his last straw. He had tried everything. He was ready to walk away. I don't know, you know, and thus that happened. He struck now, gold. He struck gold. Right. I'm not saying that that happens every time, but I'm saying like you have to, you have to view the situation and decide how far. Listen, I'm a very, very talented composer. I really am. I'm not just saying that. I'm really talented. You're good at your stuff. Yep. I'm good at my stuff. I couldn't make a living at it. Right. Because I was a classical composer, there's not too many classical composers, and it's a real male profession. I'm going to tell you, an FYI, there's not too many even women that do film music. There's more now, but when I was doing it, there wasn't any. It's a male-dominated profession. Right. I couldn't make a living at it. But this, it kept coming in front of me. I yeah, walk away. It kept coming it your, in front of it me. It was your calling. It was, it was your my calling. calling. And 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 truth be told. I'm never sorry that I made the decision finally. Do you think, but I grappled with it a long time. Right. Do you think that addiction or social media or other uh, things of that nature can deter you from your sole purpose? Like what happens if you're just a person that's sitting on Instagram and TikTok all day consuming content? Is that could that be your soul's purpose, or are you? I, I, I have a hard time believing that that's a soul purpose, Erica. Right. Unless I'm somehow sure. you're going to be able to convert that into a profession or something that you love, and and people do, by the way. I mean, there's a lot of many people, people that, do. Yeah. Many people yes. do exactly. So if that's the reason that you're doing it, because you're learning the skill about you know what all the TikToks and the whatever it is, and, right. and you're able to convert it into something you're really good at, so be it. But. Whether that is to be your life purpose or not, I think that's that's a, a kind of big stretch. Could, you know? could it deter you? And like, could you just be uh, meandering? A so any, you... anything that we're consumed with that's not you know doesn't have a a positive outcome is you know right. So and is it, making a living is making a living essential to doing your sole purpose? Or I mean, obviously, it could be being a parent. It could be you know there are many fulfilling things in the world. It depends on how you're gonna. It depends on how which how's your choice of living. Right. Do you, are you gonna? Can you live really simply? You can live very simply. I, I live without electricity and water in my twenties. <laughs> I right. wouldn't do that now, um, <laughs> you know. But for me, I needed to do that because I needed to do some soul searching. Right. And the only and, and I had the opportunity to not pay rent. That's how come I was able to live with electricity and water. I didn't have to pay rent, so uh, I you know had limited means to live on. So basically, it was just mostly food and didn't have to worry about electricity or water or internet or anything. Do you like regret that. not doing the composing? Do you regret, do you look back at your life and go, I really should have pursued it or it, it's, not, you're beyond not, that now? Not now. There was a time I did not now. Right. I would, I would like to finish my last symphony. Um, I had it performed uh, once and I had an opportunity to have it performed a second time and that didn't happen. And I, I'd like to go back and there's parts of it. I'd like to rewrite whether I'll do it or not. I don't know. I mean, right. I may, I mean, I certainly have more, you know, contacts in the universities now than I did at the time I wrote it, 
But, yeah. uh, you know, I, 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 I think that, listen, there's a lot of people that are musicians and they, they strive and strive and strive and strive and they finally can't make a living at it and they have to make a decision to do something else. So you have alternatives. You can uh, teach music. You can, you know, work into a studio. You got other, if you want to, I didn't want to do any of that. See, I only right. wanted to write music. I wasn't going to teach piano, even though I could. I wasn't, I had no interest in, uh, even though I got a degree, I had no interest in uh, teaching it in schools. I did not want to do that music. I had one thing in mind. If I wasn't going to compose, I was fortunate enough that I had this other gift. And it's interesting because it's a gift that's very similar to writing music, if you think about it, because I'm listening. I'm listening. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm attuning my ears. That's why I'm saying my ears are very, you know, very dominant in my, in my connections. Um, that's what I'm saying. When I write, I don't, it's not coming from my brain. It's coming from somewhere else. Of course, it's not coming from your brain. Right. It's, what it's doing, it's bypassing what I call logic center. That's what channeling yes. is, Michael. It's that's what channeling is. You're yes. bypassing logic center. Yes. And, when, and I, when I look back and I'll read something that I wrote, I'll, I'll write. I can't 20, believe you wrote that. And I was like, I don't know where this came from. I, right. You know, I don't know right. what, what this right. is about, but I'm, I'm reading something. I'm like that now yeah. in, in my, what you're speaking about in your life, but you're being pulled to a certain direction. Yes. You yeah. feel that there's this purpose in you and you want to accomplish this in your life. That's where I'm at now with my books and my writing right. and my. And it's good. And it's good that you listen to that because yes. the, to, to, that goes beyond the core because that means you're. I mean, listen, I mean, there, there's always, you know, writers and artists, whatever it is, you know, there's always a, a question about like, well, did you write this? Did you pick this up? Where'd you get it from? Where your ideas and stuff? We all know that everything's out there. I mean, we all know every stuff is out. That's why, you know, somebody had an idea about something and then all of a sudden, you know, like five years later, somebody else does it because that idea is stuff out there, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, but um, that's what you're doing. And what you do is, is you're doing that. And, I, and then you have like whomever who edits your stuff, you know, they do the fine tune editing thing. Personally, I think that's the place, I, my, my, own, my, my own feeling as an artist is that, you know, that's, that's the way to do it. Right. <laughs> you know, you know, it's to me, it's not about the money. To me, it's about the accomplishment. And okay. and getting that that's in my opinion. Well, you know, right. the money the money is nice, but you oh, know, like sure. we, I, you know, we our day job is we 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 work with our family and we run a global car service. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, talking with you about this. I and bet you've been really busy too during the pandemic. <laughs> no, we we got we got hammered, we got <laughs> destroyed, but you know, it's 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 picked back up and it's yeah, busy. Yeah. And now the problem is that we don't have enough cars and enough drivers. That's what I said. That's the problem with the pandemic right. here. You yes, know. Yeah, yeah. And, it was um, easy during the pandemic because we didn't have anybody to yeah, pick up. We just we yeah. sat, we did our we did Oak and Bros and we interviewed mm -hmm. people and we commiserated with each other about how terrible things are. But now, you know, things are certainly mm -hmm. a lot busier, which we're very thankful for. But it makes me feel um you know, I feel very connected to my family's business. I feel right. it's very easy. Right. You just, you know, sometimes you just know answers to things and you don't know why you know it or how you know it. Right. Right. And um, it's comforting that um, it could very well be my life's purpose to do this right. and to be with my family. That's that's all I want in this world. You love what you do. You never work a day in your life. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And the show. See, the thing is, if you, if I'm sure, listen, you know, I'm, I'm into, I'm into money. And so I, you know, I, I pick up a lot of, you know, finance stuff here and there. And if you, if you followed any person who's got a lot of money, they will tell you, you don't, you don't do it because you want the money, you, whatever you've been successful in your life, it's because you had the passion for it. 100%. That's just, that's just the outcome of it. You know, I mean, I'm sure Elon Musk with the, with Tesla just keeps going up and up and up. I mean, like he, he had that, he had this brain. He had to do something with that brain, you know, <laughs> and right. it wasn't, you know, you know, pinch and pennies. It was something with that brain. It's he amazing. just happened to become, you know, a, a millionaire. I think, I don't know if he's the richest now or second richest or whatever it is in the process of it, but that's not why he did it. Have he you ever, because that was his passion. I want to ask you a question. I don't know. We're going to wrap it up pretty soon. Have you ever um, read famous people, you know, actors, actresses, even yes. like, you know, you have. Yes. yes. Any stories that you can tell, or you kind of no. want to keep that private? All right. It's it's a, it's a, it's 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 private. Right. It's right. private. Well, you don't, I actually. Yeah. It's again um, another one you don't do. <laughs> <laughs> you need to write. You need to write like the Ten Commandments of mediumship. Uh, that's actually not a bad way of putting it, Eric. That's a good good book. That's idea. actually a good a, a good way of putting it because you could I could actually do something of that nature, um, maybe in a shorter. Yes. A shorter version as opposed to a larger version, but that's that's actually not a bad idea. 
What are the name of your books, Suzanne? Well, the first one I told you was The Seance, A Guide for the Living. The right. second one was The Seance, Healing Messages from Beyond. Then it was Second Chance. Then it was Everything Happens for a Reason, which is actually my biggest seller. Okay. And then the last one is A Medium's Cookbook. Hmm. What's that one about? Um, I wrote that book, interesting enough, when after my, my nephew died. I'm sorry to hear that. And um, I remember at that moment, all these people would come up to me all the time and like, you know, I would do anything to talk to my son again or my dad again or my mom again. And I kept thinking like, you know, n nothing had really been written. It would really help people go through maybe a process of doing it. And um, I was sitting around and so, I, don't, so, I don't know how the cookbook idea, and I don't cook, which is a joke, idea came up. But it's like, even if you don't cook, you know, a cookbook is about process, right? You right. take things out of the cabinet, you, you mix this together or mix that, or that won't go together. And this was, and I thought like, oh yeah, that's really what it's about. So it basically was a process to help you do a step-by-step -step process of connecting. It's amazing. amazing. Listen, I must say, I never know what I'm going to get out of our interviews. And I learned something incredible. new today. Incredible. And I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to to sit down with us. Um, and uh, where I, people, I, where I, I think people? we're going to need, I think we're going to need a part two. hundred okay. percent. Most definitely. You got it. Um, but I got to pick up my son from school. Uh, and Daddy, and, Daddy's, Daddy's that, the most important. That's the first job. 110%. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everybody, uh, visit SusanNorthrup.com for more information to book a session. She does group sessions. Uh, she, you have a podcast, correct? Called um, Yeah, I do. I do. I do blog talk. I have a web. I do constant webinars. If if you just do Suzanne Northrup, just Google my name. You can find me anywhere. Yeah, you have you have a very you have a great online presence. It's something to be very proud of. Thank everybody, you. Uh, Thank you. visit SusanNorthrup.com. Like, subscribe, share this show. We appreciate everybody tuning in and we'll see you all next time. Suzanne, hang on one second. We're going to sign off. Thanks, okay. everybody. You got it.